Wow, I, um, I'm just overwhelmed, Kevin and now Marcelino. Um, I will do my best to stay focused and achieve what I need to achieve now. Um, as we are now approaching that time of year when school is beginning and summer vacation is coming to an end, the scripture passage seems very appropriate as our church is now gearing back up to do the things that we as a church do. And this is a very classic text uh, from Paul and Romans. And so uh, let's hear God's message to us today from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So, what I want each and every one of you to do right now is to take your hand. You can take either one, but I'm going to use my left hand, all right? And I want you just to wiggle your fingers. And as you do so, I want you to see what's happening on the back of your hand, all right? Just look. Notice this tendon right here? Now, now I want you to just hold your hand out like this, and I want you to wiggle just this finger, your pointer finger. Make sure it's just your pointer. We don't want to insult the person next to you, all right? <laughs> There you go. But notice not, not only what's happening with this tendon right behind this knuckle, but when you wiggle your pointer finger, it also causes this one in the middle to wiggle as well, doesn't it? So just, just look. And now notice that as you wiggle your fingers, that tendon also works its way all the way down to your wrist, right? And down your arm. Now, if you can't see what's happening in your arm, just lightly touch your fingers on your forearm. And as you move your fingers, can you feel those little muscles working? Can you feel all the... How many of you have ever thought or considered that tendon and those little muscles? You usually don't think about these things until you don't have use of them, right? But just think, every day when you're picking up something, when you're needing to hold something, when you're needing to show that you're number one on the 408 when someone has cut you off. Because <laughs> I know that's what you're doing, right? You're saying, excuse me, <clears throat> right? Right, okay. All those little muscles and all those little tendons need to be working for you to be able to express yourself. A big part of human communication is not just what comes out of our mouth and what our eyes and what our face is doing, but what our hands are doing, especially if you're Italian or Greek. Or right? Dancers, right? Performers. So much. And in order to do all of that, all those tendons and all those little muscles have to do their job. Little things that many of us don't give a second thought until it's called to our attention. I, I know that when I was doing the sculpture, and I would have Parker Davis, bless his heart, holding that pose for 20 minutes at a time, and his head would drop a little bit. As soon as his head would drop, the, pose, the muscles would change in the neck and down the back. 
and he would have his arms up like this, and then he'd start to drop. As soon as he dropped his arms an inch, everything in the back would change. Parker had to pick it back up. Everything. Parker, but... <laughs> the only time I didn't have to do that is he invited his girlfriend over. <laughs> and you see all the definition that I have? That's the day I was able to get all the definition. Those muscles were popping all over his body that day. But it helped me to truly appreciate the human anatomy and how everything is so beautifully connected. And one tiny change here or there changes everything. My whole life, I've been interested in figurative drawing and art. My earliest memory as a little boy was drawing people. I know that I'm dating myself, but remember there was a TV show on called uh, Lloyd Bridges, uh, Sea Hunt, remember? Scuba divers, right? I think we called them skin divers back in those days. Sea Hunt. And my earliest memory is drawing a scuba diver. And I'd cut it out and I would play with it on a... Football players, army men, superheroes, always drawing people. My whole life. And I think it's brilliant that the Apostle Paul uses the illustration of the human body to illustrate what it means to be the body of Christ and what it means to show true worship. True worship. Now, we come here on Sunday morning and we do prayers and we do celebrations. We sing hymns and praise songs. We have sermons. And that's a part of the worship experience. And it's very important. But when we gather together, what we're doing is we're celebrating what God has done for us and what we're doing for God and the community around us. But worship goes much more deeply than that. <clears throat> so let's look at what Paul is trying to teach us about what true worship is. First of all, he says, in view of God's compassion, in view of God's compassion. So let's look at the Greek word for compassion and God's mercy, all right? God's mercy, view of God's mercy. It could also be translated compassion. This Greek word is not one that you see somebody going through a difficult time and you go, aww, that's too bad. It's a much stronger word than that. The Greek word is oiktirmas. It means compassion from the bowels. This means you see something, someone suffering to such a degree that you're moved from deep within yourself. You're moved so deeply that you think, I got to do something. You're moved to, to movement. You're moved to action. So in view of God's compassion for humanity, for this world, True worship starts there. And then Paul says, and as we are able to sense God's compassion for this world, then let ourselves become a living sacrifice. Now, living sacrifice is, is a very powerful word as well. Usually when we think of sacrifice, we think of something that in us that has to die. This is not what this phrase means. There are two Greek words for life. One is bios, right? It's biology, study of life. It's just the things that are alive. And then there's another Greek word, zoe, which means much more. Now, in this particular verse, the Greek word is zosan. And I'm going to read you the definition of zosan. Living sacrifice. And I just want you to hear, all right? Just listen. To live, breathe, be among the living. Not lifeless, not dead. So zombies do not count as zosan, all right? To enjoy real life. To have true life and worthy of the name. Active, blessed, endless in the kingdom of God. To live past life 
in the manner of living and acting of mortals or character, living water, having vital power in itself and exerting the same upon the soul, to be full of vigor, to be fresh, strong, efficient. And the adjectives of Zosan are active, powerful, and efficacious. That's what Zoe means. It means much more than being breathing creature upon this earth taking up space. It means to be full of life. So Paul says that if we view this world in God's mercy and compassion, then we choose to become a living, a vivacious, full of vigor person to be God's creation and meeting the needs of the world as a living sacrifice upon this planet. And at the same time we're doing this, then let's not be people of this world. In other words, we have to rise above and transcend the views of the world. Our world tends to be tribal. It does. We as human creatures are not that much further out of the woods than any other animal, right? We tend to want to be tribal. But God calls us as human beings created in God's image to transcend that and to renew and to transform. All right? So, the word renew in this text is anak a kinesis. Gnosis. Know the word? Gnosis. Prague, gnosis. Gnosko. Anakonosis. This is what it means. Renewal, renovation, complete change for the better. That's what it means. So if you are reading things that causes you to hate humanity more, then you're not renewing your mind. If you are reading and studying things that's transforming your mind to wanting to exterminate half the human race, then you're not renewing your mind because it's not for the better. If you are reading a theology that it portrays God in such a way that is so horrible that people can't even bear to listen to you, then chances are you're not transforming your mind for the better. So, in order to be a part of true worship, we have to be open to the fact that God views this world with compassion and mercy that comes from the bowels of God, and that God calls us to be living, full of life and vigor people who are willing to take all of that we have. And then while we're serving God and being God's hands upon this planet, that we're people who at the same time are renewing our mind constantly. Read everything you can read. Study everything you can study. Do not be afraid of anything. Say, well, if I read this, I'm afraid that it's going to challenge my faith. Don't be afraid to challenge your faith, because if your faith cannot be challenged, then it might not be a whole lot of faith there. Right? Some of the things we believe need to be challenged. If it is challenge, one of two things are going to happen. Either after your, these thoughts and beliefs have been challenged, either you will confirm them and affirm them and believe them even stronger, or you'll realize, you know what, this no longer serves me. And I need to let it go and replace it with something that is stronger, you see. And that's a part of the renewing for the better. I'm a much different human being today than I was 40 years ago because I've allowed myself and my brain to be renewed decade after decade after decade, you see. That's a part of the process of being a part of true worship. And then Paul says something about, and then because of the grace that God bestows upon me, I give this grace to you. The word grace in the Greek. Karitos, grace. This is what it means. That which affords joy, pleasure, delight, sweetness.
sweetness, charm, loveliness, grace of speech. Oh my God, does this describe the church? Really? We're going to be living sacrifices. Doing our work among the world with great charm and grace, right? Long faces, oh, we're glad to be suffering for God, right? Isn't that kind of typical? No, that's not what Paul is talking about here. Grace, and if we're going to be people of true worship, we're people who can sense from the bowels of God's mercy and compassion upon humanity, and as we become God's hands and feet and minds and voices in this earth, we serve as living sacrifices, giving the vigor in all of our life to bring grace and strength and charm and beauty. Think about the word grace. Whenever you see someone dancing, you know, a ballerina, or I love contemporary dance. That's my favorite modern dance, contemporary. And when you see a beautiful body that is just so strong, and it's just moving just like a feather across the stage, and it's just able to do things, you think, my gosh, it's like it defies gravity. And it brings me joy to be able to see your body doing that. Grace. Think about animals in the wild, and animals that we describe as graceful when they're running or they're trotting. You know? Grace. Think about grace in that manner. That what you do brings sweetness. What you do is joyful. You see? And at this state of what Paul is talking about, now we can tell that Paul is from the Midwest. He's from Iowa, Minnesota. He's from Indiana, right? Because he says... Um, don't go thinking too much of yourselves. You're, be be okie dokie, all right? Okay, now I want to offer something. Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. This doesn't mean don't love yourself. But there's a difference between loving yourself and being narcissistic. All right? Narcissism means the world revolves around you and everything is about you. But when you love yourself... You have the capacity to love others at a much greater level. You see? And you have the capacity to be a person of incredible grace. And you have the capacity to be a person of incredible strength and wisdom. So he says, be sober with judgment. And that word sober is the Greek word transliterated D-E-O. It's pronounced Deo. I know the first thing that I went, Deo, <coughs> Deo, all right? It's not the same thing. But Deo in the Greek means to bind, to fasten, to fasten with chains. Right? But what it means, means literally is don't think of yourselves too highly, but bind yourselves soberly to judgment and wisdom. This is what you want to bind yourself to not self-aggrandizement, and not to, to bind yourself to judgment and wisdom. Not judging others, but good judgment and wisdom, right? So a part of being a people of good and pure worship is sensing God's compassion for the world, being a people who are full of life and vigor and who are who choose to use that full life to minister to the world around them and to do so and by renewing their mind and constantly learning and growing and, and, and who do so with grace, with joy and thanksgiving, right? And as you're doing it, you're not thinking, oh, look how wonderful I am. Oh, I'm the most wonderful Christian in all the world. No, you do so humbly. You do so thinking, oh, as I do this, I see the wisdom and the grace, and, the, and, you, and you seek judgment, and you seek wisdom in all that you do. And then after all this, 
Paul then starts turning to the individuals within the church, and once again, we see grace come up. Next slide. He says, we have different gifts according to the grace, caritas, to the grace given to us, that which affords joy and pleasure. If you have the gift of prophecy, then prophesy. If you have the gift of teaching, then, then, then teach. If you have the gift of serving, then, then serve. If you have the gift of giving, then give. Give generously. If you have the gift of encouragement, then encourage. If you have the gift of leading, then, then lead and do it cheerfully. You see? But you do so with grace and thanksgiving. If you wake up on a Sunday morning and you say, Oh, God, i got to help with fellowship today. Then don't help with fellowship today. It's not a good day for you or for fellowship. <laughs> if that's the spirit you're bringing to it. And look, serving humanity, serving this church, it's my job. All right? And I will confess to you, some days I feel more into it than, than others. Some days I'm just, I'm tired. I'm, you know. But this is the wisdom that I've learned. If I'm serving out of obligation and there's no real love, compassion, and grace, then guess what I need to do? I need to rest. Even Jesus had to rest. Whenever you are, whatever it is that you're doing in this world, whomever it is that you're serving, and you find that it's starting to turn to resistance, resentment rather than grace, then, then step back for a little bit. Recharge. Because we're undoing what we're trying to achieve if we go into it with a spirit that's not one of joy and pleasure. You see? Does that make sense? We don't need any more martyrs. One of my counselors told me years ago, you know what, you, you tend to want to be a martyr, Barton. I just, 2,000 years ago, there was a guy named Jesus. He already did that for everybody else. You're off, you're off the hook, buddy. You don't need to do that, all right? I kind of needed to hear that. 20 years ago. But there's just like this, this false thing that we as children of God and as servants of God, we need just to be doing so with a bird. Forget about it. That's not what it is. True worship is worship where we sense God's compassion for the world, where we offer these bodies and these lives that are full of vigor and full of life, and we serve with this incredible joy. And all the while we're doing it, we're learning and we're going and we're growing and we're transforming. You see? And when you get tired, rest. Because you don't want to be undoing what you've accomplished. So, God has graced you with gifts. Things that bring you pleasure and joy. What are they? What are your gifts? How are you using your gifts? And in what spirit are you using your gifts? Go back to looking at your hand, all right? All right, look at, I want you to focus on that little tendon right there, all right? Let's, let's look at that little tendon, all right, there you go. Now I want you to, to use your imagination and I want you to project upon that tendon human feeling, all right? I think we call it anthropomorphizing, right? You were doing an animation. You'd put a little face and a little mouth on that tendon. What would that tendon be feeling every time you call upon it to do its little tendon thing, to move that finger? Right? Just think about it. Every time your brain calls upon that tendon to do what it needs to do for your hand to do what it needs to do, what would that tendon be doing? Nailed it! Yes! It fulfilled its purpose completely. Right? That's what I sense that the true worship is all about. 
when we, as God's children, as God's hands upon this planet, are fulfilling completely our gifts graced upon us with joy and with vigor, then we experience true worship and joy, right? And no gift is too small. Some parts of our body have more important gifts than others. You can do without your hand, but you can't do without your heart. Some people have been doing without their brains for a very long time, but you still need it. <clears throat> Every part of us is so important. And as we serve this world and as we serve our church, everybody has a part. You've been gifted with grace to do your part. And there's a wonderful quote from Gandalf on the Lord of the Rings. Do we have that slide? Can we throw it up there? Gandalf has just had a council with the elves and Saruman, and they just realized that evil has returned to Middle-earth. And now everybody's gone but he and Gladriel. And they're having a conversation about what they're going to do. And then he says to her, Some believe it is only... <laughs> Some believe it is only great power that can hold evil in check. But that is not what I have found. I have found that it is the small, everyday deeds of ordinary folk that keep the darkness at bay. Small acts of kindness and love. And there's not a person in this room cannot achieve that. Every single day, everybody here can do a small act of kindness and love. Here and in the world out there. True worship is when we sense God's compassion for this world and we choose to, to take action and to offer our life, not by us, but Zoe, and to use our gifts, our gifts that bring us pleasure and joy to share knowing that as we do so we're not only renewing our minds and our soul but to those around us And we do it with a spirit of joy. And when we do this, we not only are experiencing true worship, but we bring pleasure to God. Thus ends the lesson. Let us pray. Gracious, beautiful God, how it warms my heart that you're not just some divine being aloof in the universe somewhere, but that you know my heart and my soul intimately as you do every being upon this planet, every creature. and you have compassion for me and everyone here and every creature. And God, I must say, it is an honor to be asked by you to be a part of your body and to be your hands and bring in peace and comfort and healing to a world that chooses to stay broken most all the time. It's a pleasure, God, serving you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.